uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for uh, setting up this wonderful virtual platform um, and for allowing me the opportunity to present my work here. And uh, secondly, let me thank uh, Dr. Ayan for being such a wonderful mentor over the past several months. Um, I wouldn't be speaking here at QIP if it wasn't for his um, incredible supervision and intellect. Okay, so let me begin with uh, some motivation about uh, the stuff that I'm going to speak about and a brief outline of, of my talk. So as is probably evident from the title, uh, my, my talk broadly lies within the realm of entanglement theory. So, uh, and I don't think that I need to motivate the importance of entanglement to the audience uh, of this conference, but I mean, entanglement is arguably the most fundamental uh, non-classical feature of quantum theory. And uh, um, I would say that over the past few decades, um, it has garnered an incontestable reputation as a resource of immense practical worth. Um, but uh, the problem, or I would say the complexity of the theory stems from the fact that it is not possible for any classical algorithm to efficiently determine whether or not uh, the given quantum state is entangled, right? Um, and so in the first half of my talk, I will uh, present a highly non-trivial yet computationally efficient method of detecting entanglement in bipartite quantum states. So uh, this method, it exploits a strange and intriguing connection between two widely different mathematical objects. So on one hand, we have graphs from discrete mathematics, and on the other hand, we have entangled quantum states. And so um, it turns out that there is this special kind of entanglement, which I call triangle-free entanglement, which likes to hide itself behind these intriguing patterns of vertices and edges uh, that do not contain any triangles. So I will make all of this precise uh, shortly. And then in the second half of the talk, we will see how the techniques developed in the first half can be exploited to tackle an open problem in quantum information theory, or I would say a special case of, of an open problem in quantum information theory, which is uh, the, that of the PPT squared conjecture. Okay, so uh, let me begin by uh, introducing the kind of states that we consider uh, here. So these are bipartite states. And uh, these are states which have a special uh, invariance property, uh, namely that they, they, they stay invariant under this local diagonal orthogonal conjugation. So these O matrices, they are diagonal matrices, D cross D diagonal matrices, which, are, uh, which have just plus minus one on the diagonal. And so it turns out that this kind of uh, states, they can be nicely parameterized um, using these three matrices. Um, and so these are three complex matrices and this is the parameterization. Um, so, uh, and so the upshot of this parameterization is that we can very nicely uh, characterize uh, the properties of this state in terms of some constraints on these matrices. So for example, if uh, we want this state or this matrix to be a quantum state, we want it to be positive semi-definite and that requires that the A matrix should be entry-wise non-negative. So this curly inequality represents entry-wise non-negativity. B should be positive semi-definite. C should be self-adjoint and certain entry-wise inequalities um, must hold between the entries of A and C. And in addition, if we have, for example, the positivity under partial transposition, then C must also be positive semi-definite and A and B should satisfy certain entry-wise inequalities. And uh, so this class of states, this is quite rich. And there are a lot of examples from literature which uh, lie in this class. For example, uh, we have the diagonal symmetric states or the Werner and isotropic states and, and, and so on. So just for illustration purpose, this is how a uh, three tensor three LDOI state looks like. So as you can see the A matrix, it occupies the diagonal entries and the B and C matrix matrices, they occupy certain off diagonal positions uh, and everything else is uh, zero. All right, so um, let us recall the notion of separability. Uh, a state, bipartite state is called separable if it can be decomposed in this fashion where these are pure product states. And so it turns out that the, we can characterize the separability of these uh, LDOI states very nicely in terms of uh, the cone of triple wise completely positive matrices. So basically the statement is that the state row ABC, this is separable if and only if the associated triple ABC, it, it can be decomposed in this fashion, where uh, these V and Ws, they, they form a finite set of uh, vectors. 
and these uh, circle with a dot inside it, it's, it denotes entry-wise product of, of vectors and this bar denotes uh, entry-wise complex conjugation. So, and why do we call this uh, triple-wise complete positivities? Because, I mean, it turns out that if this triple is such that um, these three matrices, they are all equal, then the triple-wise complete positivity is equivalent to complete positivity of this A matrix. And complete positivity is a well-studied notion in matrix analysis and optimization theory. And that is, that is why we call them triple-wise completely positive. And this result also allows us to, uh, to say that the membership problem for deciding membership in the TCP cone, this is uh, actually also NP hard because the membership problem for completely positive cone, it's NP hard. And so, I mean, uh, one might wonder well, why do we, why do we bother to, you know, introduce this notion if the, if the, if we are not, you know, reducing the hardness of the problem. Um, uh, and this is where the notion of uh, graphs and uh, triangle freeness comes into picture. So what we do is we take an arbitrary uh, bipartite matrix and uh, we collect the diagonal entries of this matrix in this uh, a new matrix that we call A. And then we associate a, a graph to this state, uh, a D vertex graph. Uh, and in this graph, any two distinct vertices, they are connected by an edge if and only if the corresponding entries of A, AIJ and AJI, they are non-zero. And, and we say that the state is triangle free if the corresponding graph uh, does not contain any triangles. So for, for example, if you look at this matrix here, uh, this, the corresponding graph is just this square or a four cycle. So if you notice that uh, since A24 and A31, these, these two entries are zero, uh, the corresponding vertices, they are not connected by an edge. Uh, and so we, we, can, we can see that this graph is triangle free. So uh, how does this help us? So it turns out that if our state is separable, then uh, this triangle free property on top of the uh, condition on the state, uh, and which is, which is this. So this, the theorem is that if our state is triangle free and separable, then uh, these comparison matrices of B and C, they must be positive semi-definite. For any complex matrix B, we define its comparison matrix entry-wise in this fashion. So uh, the diagonal of this comparison matrix is just the absolute value of the entries of the diagonal of the original matrix. And the off-diagonal entries, we just take the absolute value and flip the sign. And so the way to prove it, prove it is very simple. So since the... ...decomposition, and uh, then what we can do is we can uh, use the triangle free property of our state to show that these vectors, they have small common supports. So this expression here, this denotes the size of the common support of these vectors, V and W. And, and, and the triangle free property of the state forces this, these common supports to be of size less than or equal to two for each K. And this is the crucial step. And so once we have this, we can use the form of the B matrix to easily deduce that the comparison matrix must be positive semi-definite. And we can do the same thing for C. So what this gives us is a very nice uh, necessary condition for separability of triangle-free LDY states, which we can easily exploit to uh, devise our primary entanglement detection strategy. And so this is the main, main theorem for the first part. So, Notice that here we are not restricting to the LDUI subspace. This row here can be any bipartite state. And we collect the diagonal entries of this state in A matrix, and we collect the certain off-diagonal position, uh, certain off-diagonal entries of row into, into these B and C matrices. And then the theorem says that if either of these comparison matrices, MB or MC, are not positive semi-definite, then the state is guaranteed to be entangled. And it is clear that this, this result must hold for LDOIs because we just saw that positivity of these matrices is a necessary condition for separability. Uh, but for non-LDOI uh, states, uh, what we can do is we can actually project the state locally onto the LDOI subspace by using this local averaging operation. And since this operation is local, it preserves separability and then we can apply the previous characterization again to deduce the result. Okay, so let me quickly talk about some consequences of this of this theorem. So, uh, 
let's imagine this let's uh, let's say we ask a child to draw you know a bunch of points and and connect them up with lines on a piece of paper and let's say he or she he comes up with this this drawing or this one or let's say this um, or let's say with this big big mess so the point is that as long as the drawings they do not have any triangles inside of them we can use our theorem to translate or transform this drawing into a family of entangled states bipartite entangled states and we can even impose additional constraints on 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 that family we can we can impose the condition of positivity under partial transposition and if this is a d vertex graph then the corresponding family will have d squared real parameters inside um, and so as you can imagine as uh, the, as the number of vertices they increase so does the number of different triangle free graphs on those vertices right and and correspondingly the number of triangle free and triangle families of states also increase and so for instance in just a 15 tens of 15 sub uh, system uh, we can use this method to construct around 10 to the power 10 distinct families of ppt entangled states and the strange thing is that uh, these states the entanglement inside them cannot be detected uh, using traditional methods of entanglement simply because of this incredible diversity that they have. I mean, they are D squared real parameters in, in a D tensor D state. And so we can very easily tweak the parameters, you know, in order to escape detection from any of the usual tests. And that is why these billions and billions of families of states, they have managed to stay hidden uh, um, up until this point, but I guess um, not anymore. Okay, so how does all of this connect with the PPT squared conjecture? So to make this connection, um, then the, the question that we ask is, what can we say about the converse of, of this theorem? Um, so let us recall the theorem itself. So we saw that if we have an LDOI state rho ABC, which is separable, um, and the vectors that form the TCP decomposition of this associated triple ABC, if they are such that uh, the size of the common support of these vectors for each k is at most two, then we saw that this implies that the corresponding comparison matrices M, B, and M of C must be positive semi-definite, right? And so now we flip this around and ask this question. So let's say we just have an arbitrary LDOI state and we know that the corresponding comparison matrices are positive semi-definite. So Given this information, can we already conclude that the state is separable? Um, and this would be very nice because this would give us a, a sufficient condition for deciding membership in, in this cone of separable matrices. And this membership problem is actually NP hard, but here we just need to check positivity of these two matrices and we'll be done. So this would give us a very nice, uh, easily verifiable sufficient condition for deciding membership in, in, in this cone. And so it turns out that this converse, this holds it does not hold in general, but it holds for a special subclass of matrices within this LDOI class. And these are the matrices which are parameterized uh, as follows. And uh, so notice that we here, here we only have two matrices, A and B, D cross D complex matrices with equal diagonals. The only difference between this uh, class and the previous one is the exception of the C matrix, which is omitted here. And again, we can we can repeat the previous procedure to to uh, characterize positivity of this matrix in terms of some constraints on A and B. So here, A must be entry-wise non-negative, and B must be positive semi-definite. In addition, if the state is also positive under partial transposition, then um, certain entry-wise inequalities must hold. And so it turns out that this new class of states or subclass that we have, it satisfies stronger invariance condition, namely this. So these states, they are actually invariant under this conjugate local diagonal unitary operation. Uh, and notice that here we have, these matrices are diagonal unitary matrices. So they are diagonal matrices with complex phases as, uh, as their entries. And this is a larger group, right? Because this contains the uh, diagonal orthogonal group as a subgroup. So this is a stronger invariance condition than the previous one. And, and, and consequently, the resulting states, they are uh, parameterized by less number of parameters, right? Because we don't have the C matrix here. So it makes sense because we are making the invariance stronger and, and hence reducing the number of parameters. 
Okay, so again, the, we can characterize separability of these matrices in terms of the cone of pairwise completely positive matrices. So the definition is basically identical, except for the fact that we do not have the C part here. And now we we uh, define an additional additional uh, uh, concept here. We say that if this de if this decomposition is such that uh, the corresponding vectors they have the common support of each of these V and W is less than or equal to K then we say that the pair AB has factor width K. So in this termin terminology, uh, our previous discussion on triangle free entanglement can be thought to lie within the case of factor width two PCP matrices, right? Uh, and so this is the main uh, converse that I was talking about. So this is the, this is the theorem. So let's say we have a, a, a CLDUI state. This is a conjugate local diagonal unitary invariant state. This is the abbreviation for that. And we have an arbitrary PPT CLDY state. Then uh, the separability, or I would say positivity of the comparison matrix of B is equivalent to uh, factor with two pairwise complete positivity of the um, associated matrix pair. And notice that this in particular implies that the state is separable. Um, and, and, and the reverse implication is not true because separability only implies PCP property and, and says nothing about uh, factor widths. Um, and so uh, notice again that the reverse implication here has already been proven. We already saw that this factor width two implies that the corresponding comparison matrix is positive semi-definite, but so the non-trivial implication in this theorem is the forward one, and it requires some non-trivial techniques from matrix theory, in particular from the theory of non-negative matrices, and I'm not going to delve into the proof of this, but this is the main result, and, and the, um, the take-home message from this theorem is that we have a very easily verifiable sufficient condition to, to guarantee membership in the cone of separable states. Okay, so now with this, we come to the main, the PPT squared conjecture. So let me, let me introduce the conjecture quickly. So the conjecture says that if we have a, a arbitrary, two arbitrary bipartite states, then this big expression is separable, corresponds to a separable state. So the way to think about this is as follows. Let's say we have three parties, Alice, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and Charlie shares a PPT state row with Alice, and Charlie shares another PPT state sigma with Bob. Uh, and if, if the statement says that if we trace out the degrees of freedom of Charlie in this fashion, then the resulting state on Alice and Bob, Bob's subsystem, they, it should be separable. Um, and so with, uh, it, this can actually be thought of as a generalized uh, entanglement swapping procedure. So, I mean, notice that since, I mean, even though these states are PPT, they can still have some entanglement. And so what we're trying to do here is uh, to transfer the entanglement that Charlie shares separately with Alice and, and with Bob to the entanglement that is shared between Alice and Bob. And so the PPT squared conjecture says that this is not possible if these states are PPT. Uh, and so this kind of swapping procedure that becomes important in, in certain kinds of quantum cryptographic protocols where the task is to you know, establish some sort of a secret key between Alice and Bob. And then again, in, in those situations, the conjecture would imply that if the states that are being used here are PPT, then no matter what these three parties do locally, local operations, and fi but finally, when, when one traces out the degrees of freedom of Charlie, the resulting state on Alice's and Bob's system uh, is separable. And so you cannot use it for cryptographic purposes to distill any secret key. And, uh, and this conjecture is actually can be formulated in terms of uh, linear maps between matrix algebras by using the choi jomiokoisky isomorphism. And in that language, it says that if we have two arbitrary PPT maps, so these are maps which are completely positive and completely co-positive at the same time, uh, and if we have two such maps, then if we just compose them together, this is just the usual map composition, then the comp composition results in a entanglement breaking map. So this is the analog of separability for linear maps. And it says that the partial action of such a map on any bipartite system must result in a separable state. Okay, so let me quickly tell you about some uh, progress that has already been made on the proof of this conjecture. So we already know that the conjecture it holds for d equal to two and d equal to three dimension. And notice that for d equal to two, this is almost trivial because we know that PPT is equivalent to separability. And for d equal to three, it requires a bit more effort, but it has been shown. Uh, we also know that given any unital or trace preserving PPT map, 
we know that that this map is as, act, actually asymptotically entanglement breaking, meaning that if you compose the map with itself uh, 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 several number of times, then in the limit, this this uh, sequence this approaches the set of entanglement breaking maps. And uh, we also know that every unital PPT channel quantum channel, it becomes entanglement breaking after finitely many rounds of composition with itself. And we have some other partial results. We know that the conjecture it holds for uh, uh, the class of fully unitary covariant maps. So these are the well-known Hulevo Werner channels. And the conjecture also holds uh, for a specific class of maps in infinite dimensions, which are known as um, Gaussian maps. Okay, um, and so as you can see, the preferred language in which the results of the PPT squared conjecture are usually stated is that of uh, linear maps between matrix algebras. But since our discussion up until this point has been uh, in the setting of bipartite matrices, I'm going to stick with that and state the main result in the language of bipartite matrices. But I'm just going to quickly mention that using the Chori Jomilkoisky isomorphism, we can easily translate everything in the language of uh, uh, linear maps between matrix algebra. So I told you Mielkowski isomorphism, it will identify these class of states that we have with certain kinds of maps. And we can look at how this map acts on the on the matrix space. We can characterize its uh, certain covariance property and, and so on. And uh, it turns out that the classic Choi map that we have um, that acts on the three cross three matrices, uh, it is actually of this form, the, the map that we get uh, from our states. Uh, and so this is also the reason why these maps are also sometimes called Choi type maps. But anyways, uh, let me now come to the main, main uh, theorem. So this is the theorem five that we had earlier. This is the main tool that will be used in the proof of the theorem. So we saw that, let us recall the theorem. We saw that if we have a PPT CLDUI state rho AB and uh, then we, we can conclude the separability. We can conclude that the state is separable if we know that the corresponding comparison matrix is positive semi-definite, right? And so it turns out that this is precisely what we need to show or prove the PPT squared conjecture for these states. So this is the main theorem. PPT squared conjecture holds for CLDY states. And how, do, how does one prove this? So first of all, let's, let's, let's take two arbitrary PPT CLDY states. And these are parameterized by these A, B, and C, D matrices. So the first step is to write down this composition, right? And, and one can show that this composition again results in a CLDUI state uh, where the associated <clears throat> matrices X and Y, they are given as follows. So X is just the matrix product of A and C and Y is the entry-wise product of B and D. And this term, diagonal term here is just to make sure that uh, the diagonal of X and Y, they are equal. Um, and the second step is to show that the resulting state that we have here is again PPT, and this step is almost trivial. Uh, and finally, we can now apply the theorem five, right? Because we have all the ingredients here. We have a PPT CLDY state. And so the only thing left is to show that the comparison matrix MY is positive semi-definite, and this requires a bit of work, but it can be shown. And, and once we show this, we can immediately apply the theorem five to conclude that the, uh, the state is separable. And uh, so I wanted to talk a bit about how does one show the okay, positivity of these, minutes. this matrix. Have two more minutes. Sure, yeah, I'm just I'm just coming to the conclusion, right? Yeah. So uh, let me let me skip this. This is a bit technical, but I mean, it's it's straightforward. And if anyone in, in, is interested, he or she can pause this slide and look at the computation here. Uh, okay, so let me now come to the conclusion uh, and, and let me talk about some future directions that one can follow. Okay, so we saw that in the first half of the talk, we, we, we unraveled this connection between graphs and entanglement, right? And so the natural question to ask is, uh, you know, this bridge that we constructed between these two different realms of study, can this bridge be used to import techniques from one of the realms into the other or vice versa because i mean graph theory entanglement theory they are separately mature i would say and it would be it would be interesting interesting to explore more connections between two between these two fields of study uh, and the ppt squared conjecture obviously in general it is still open um, we don't know how to prove it or refute it 
for general states. And in particular, we don't know if the conjecture even holds for the uh, for the the, uh, the class of states that we considered in the first part of the talk, right? These LDY states, which are parameterized by three matrices, because we we saw that the converse of the statement it does not hold for these matrices. So the conjecture, in particular, uh, is still open for these states. Okay, so with this, I think I, I should conclude. Uh, these are some of the references that were used in this talk. Uh, and, and these three papers uh, towards the bottom, these are the papers on which this talk was based. And if anyone in, is interested, he or she can look, look these up. Um, and okay, so let me, let me thank, thank you and for your attention. And I would be happy to answer any questions that, um, that are there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cedric, for your very interesting talk. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. So the first question is from Alexander Muller-Hermes. And so I have the same question as well. Mm -hmm. So it's for the first part of your talk where you're talking about this map. So if you have any graph, you can get this entangled state. And so the question is, in what sense can you not use the usual test to detect entanglement for these sets of states? Uh, in what sense can I not use the usual detection strategies to detect entanglement? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let me. Uh, so I said it's hard to do. Yes. 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 So the point is that uh, let's say we we have a, a a family of states that we construct using this method. Let's say it's a D tensor D family of states. This will be parameterized by. Uh, around d squared real parameters. So what I was able to do computationally is to try, you know, like the usual semi-definite hierarchies um, to, to detect entanglement or, it, or even simpler, if we talk about the PPT test, I mean, the positivity and the partial transposition, then we can actually explicitly impose PPT condition on our families of state so that we can be sure that positivity or partial transposition of positivity cannot be used to detect entanglement. And if we are, if we move one step further, and if we ask whether the semi-definite hierarchies, for instance, they can be used to detect the test. So the thing is that we can vary these parameters inside. So there are lots of lots and lots of parameters in these families of states, and they can be very easily tweaked uh, to, you know, escape detection from any of the usual tests. So I mean, it's still not clear what's uh, i mean uh, if we can you know given these states can we find for instance suitable witnesses that can detect this entanglement in the usual sense of detection but the point is that because these states are so diverse and and the parameters inside are so large we can easily change the parameters in order to escape detection from any of the usual tests but uh, i mean obviously more work or more stuff has to be done in order to fully answer this question um, okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. And so the next question is from Matthew Pistol. And so can you comment a bit more about the proof of the serum five? Proof of uh, serum five. five, this one? I yes. So. Okay. So we saw, we already saw the reverse implication, right? Uh, we saw that factor width two implies that the comparison matrix is positive semi-definite. For the forward direction, um, we will have to use uh, the Perron Frobenius theorem for non negative matrices so we can get hold of um, the Perron eigenvector for this B matrix. So, this is this M of B, this is like a, a matrix which has positive entries on the diagonal and negative entries on the off diagonal. And so, we can write it in, in as, a, as a difference of certain entry-wise non-negative matrix with um, with uh, another entry-wise non-negative matrix. And then you can use non-trivial techniques from the theory of entry-wise non-negative matrices to deduce that. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit technical, but I mean, if, if people are interested in looking at the proof, then it is contained in, in this uh, preprint here. I mean, I don't know if it can be described using words. I mean, it will not be very helpful. So the interested folks should should look up this preprint. It's, it's everything is there in, in full, rigor okay thank you so i think we only have time for one more question and so this question is from san yun chen and so the can you comment on the in intuition behind the codui states i think it's also raised to the same theorem i guess uh okay the intuition okay so um if you look at the definition if if one replaces these diagonal unitaries with the full unitary group let's say 
Um, then what we get are the usual Werner states, right? And we have just single parameter inside. They can they and we can we can conclude lots of things about those class of states. In particular, we know that PPT is equivalent to separability for those states. So the point is that we are relaxing this uh, strong condition, full unitarily invariant uh, condition by just diagonal unitary invariance, uh, and and and. And so uh, we are actually getting a, a, a larger class of states. And uh, the point is that these states, they are in some sense at intermediate complexity between the full class of bipartite states and, uh, and the Werner states, which, are, which have just one single parameter inside. So this is intermediate complexity. And it turns out that, in that at this intermediate complexity level, we can say non-trivial things about the separability, for instance, as we have already seen. Uh, and, uh, and that's why this becomes interesting. And, and also, there are lots of examples in literature uh, of states. You know, People have considered these states in different contexts, but all of these states, it turns out that they can be kind of you know, gathered together under this umbrella of invariance condition. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we're out of time, sense. and so you can ask. Yeah, you can ask the remaining questions at the roundabout table after the plenary session. Okay, and so thank you again, Santik, for and all the speakers for for the very interesting talks, and we can conclude with that for today. Okay, thank you very much.